Let's talk about some theories of deviance. First, from the perspective of functionalism. Functionalism maintains that deviance serves a function in our society. The sociologist Durkheim says that deviance is a positive social function that it clarifies moral boundaries and promotes social cohesion. That without seeing deviant behavior, we would have a hard time classifying what is normal. It isn't until our group norms are challenged that we come together as a group to defend these norms. For example, the tragic events of September 11, 2001 challenged a norm that many people in the United States took for granted, that being safety. When the norm was challenged by terrorist attacks, new policies and procedures were put into place. For example, airport, airport security, think TSA, to preserve it. Conflict theory looks at deviance in this way that is the result of social conflict, that the powerful maintain power by marginalizing and criminalizing people who threaten their power, that inequality is produced by the way that deviance is defined. Vagrancy laws are in place because the people in power, those who are representatives of dominant culture, have deemed vagrancy to be deviant. Sociologist William Chambliss looked at how the vagrancy laws have been applied differently over the years to the homeless, unemployed, racial minorities, or whoever seemed the most threatening at the time. He determined that vagrancy laws actually reproduce inequality in our society. The structural strain theory developed by Robert Merton maintains that there are goals in our society that people want to achieve, but they can't always. And this in turn creates stress or strain because people are aware of the goals that they wish to achieve, but they don't have the means to achieve them. Sometimes structural strain theory is just called strain theory. And it acknowledges that there are certain goals that society deems to be acceptable. Can you think of what some of these goals might be? You might think of things such as a nice car, a big house, a family, a good job, lots of money, and so on. Sometimes people will just characterize it as the American dream, which is a common theme about what Americans should achieve to be called successful. Strain theory talks about the difficulties that people may have in trying to achieve these goals, and they can be many. And then the frustration that occurs between knowing what the goals are and not being able to achieve them is the basis of Merton's strain theory typologies that we're going to examine next. Now, let's look at Merton's typology of deviance. This table shows the possible combinations of goals and means acceptance. Remember, goals are not individual or personal goals like saving enough money to buy a new smartphone. Rather, they are socially acceptable goals like the ones we talked about earlier, including the American dream or having a good job, a nice home, a car, money, and so on. Means are the ways of making that happen. For instance, means may refer to socially acceptable routes to achieving the aforementioned goals, like going to college, working hard, starting at the bottom of the company ladder, but working your way to the top, and so on. The first in Merton's typology is conformist. Conformists accept the goals of the society and the means of achieving those goals. These are the people who work hard in school, go to college, get a job, and save money 
because they want to buy a new house, have a fancy car, wear nice clothes, and contribute to their retirement plans. Innovators. Innovators accept the goals of society, but they look for new or innovative ways of achieving those goals. These are the people who want all the same things as the conformance, a fancy house, nice car, designer clothes, but they aren't interested in going to college and working their way up through the company. Can you think of some examples? You might think readily of someone like Bill Gates who dropped out of college, but also people like drug dealers and pimps. They've all found different ways to achieving the culturally accepted goals. Ritualists aren't interested in the goals of society, but they do accept the means of achieving those goals. They don't seem to think about the goal or the big picture and instead they live their lives day to day, paycheck to paycheck. They go to work, have a steady job and so on, but they probably live in an apartment, maybe in a family member's basement, their parents' basement. They don't talk about their career moves or retirement and they simply keep doing their routines every day. You may not be able to think of some popular examples because these famous people that we oftentimes think of don't present themselves as ritualists. But if you can think of some characters in a movie or a TV show who would fit this typology, then you'll start to realize what it is when we talk about people who are fall into the ritualist category. Retreatists, they don't accept the goals of society or the means of achieving those goals. Retreaters aren't interested in the goals and they don't follow the day-to-day -day routine to achieve the means either. Oftentimes, retreaters withdraw from the system completely. Examples might be a hermit or a person who goes to the mountains to live with goats. You might think that people who are homeless would fit into this category. While it's possible that a person would give up his or her home to withdraw from the system, we have to be careful about making assumptions because the majority of homeless people are not in that circumstance by choice. Then rebels. Rebels don't accept the goals of society or the means of achieving those goals, so they create their own goals by creating new means. Rebels are those people who don't accept the goals of society and disagree with the means of achieving them. That means that these people don't covet lots of money, a fancy house, a nice car, and so on. Let's do a quick quiz on deviants, the typologies from Meriton. According to structural strain theory, who would like, most likely renounce the culture's goals and means entirely and live outside of conventional norms? A, deviants, B, innovators, C, ritualists, D, retreatists, E, rebels. The answer is D, retreatist. A professional gambler who makes $250,000 per year Consider, is considered what, according to structural strain theory? A, a deviant, B, an innovator, C, a ritualist, D, a retreatist, or E, a rebel? And the answer is B, an innovator. According to structural strain theory, an individual who deals drugs in order to get rich would be called A or N, A, conformist, B, innovator, C, ritualist, or D, retreatist? And the answer is B, innovator. We now turn our discussion to deviance and crime. 
Remember that we said that deviance is behavior that violates the values and norms of a group. Not that it is inherently wrong. However, research on deviance also includes crime. And crime is the violation of a norm that has been codified into law. Again, deviance is referring to an act or behavior that is simply different from what the majority group typically does and thus receives a negative response. In the United States, eating a guinea pig would be considered deviant because most people don't do that. But in Peru, many people eat guinea pigs as a staple of their diet. Eating guinea pigs isn't wrong, but depending upon the culture you're from, it can definitely be different from a group norm. When we consider crime, we also have to consider control and punishment. And there are four main philosophies of punishment. Deterrence is that we prevent crime by harsh penalties. Retribution is to retaliate or take revenge for a crime committed. Incapacitation is the act of removing criminals from society by imprisoning them. While rehabilitation is reforming criminals so that they may re-enter society. Each of these philosophies takes a different approach to punishment. Rehabilitation, for example, suggests that we should include education and training in prisons so that prisoners will be able to contribute to society upon their release. In practice, these philosophies often overlap. Deterrence. If you're in a hurry to class and you start to exceed the speed limit, do you ever slow down because you think, I don't want to get a speeding ticket? If so, the potential penalty has deterred you from committing the crime. Retribution. Have you ever heard the saying, an eye for an eye? That's the premise behind retribution. You've committed a crime, therefore society has the right to retaliate in a certain way. Incapacitation may depend upon the severity of the crime committed. If our society imprisoned every person who ever jaywalked, there would be a few people left out in society. Then again, if the penalty for jaywalking was imprisonment, maybe fewer people would do it. That's part of the logic behind creating sentences for crimes. Rehabilitation has different degrees of success or failure depending upon the crime committed. However, even though rehabilitation is usually less expensive than incarceration, we tend to see more sentences of incarceration than rehabilitation. Why do you think this is? Are there certain crimes that you think should receive more rehabilitation than incarceration? What about drug use or possession? Think about it.